Hey guys, Paul Lacey is presenting today uh, the native and invasive aquatic plant species in Virginia trout streams. Dr. Benzine is his advisor and please give him your full undivided attention and save your questions for that. Thank you very much, man. Um, so, hi everyone, thanks for showing up to my presentation. My uh, capstone was a research project that focused on, uh, that sought to understand how aquatica plants affect uh, Virginia uh, trout habitat. And uh, I decided on this project along with Dr. Benzing because I have a real uh, big interest in like biodiversity and he has an interest in rook trout and habitat restoration. So we talked through some things and just thought this would be an interesting uh, field to study. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my sponsor, the Garden Club of Virginia. Their mission statement is to celebrate the beauty of the land, to conserve the gifts of nature, and to challenge future generations to build on this heritage. Um, they provided me, or they had a uh, conservation and environmental fellowship, and I applied for it and I got it, and it supplied me with $4,000 to fund my research. So, the purpose of this project was to investigate how native and invasive aquatic plants affect brook trout streams in Virginia. And what I was really hoping to find is that native plants uh, are more beneficial for the environment and support or create better conditions for brook trout. Um, I was hoping to find out that they could support uh, more aquatic bugs, which are a food source for the fish, and they would also, streams that have fewer invasive species would have better water quality parameters. So, why is it important to study brook trout habitat? The brook trout is uh, the state fish of Virginia, and it's the only salmonid species native to Virginia. Uh, it is also an excellent indicator species of water quality because they can only live in cold, clean streams that have relatively high dissolved oxygen content. And uh, this figure over here shows that their historical range has been reducing, or you know, their historical habitat has been declining over the past years for many reasons. Two of the major reasons are that streams are getting warmer due to deforestation and climate change, making it so that they're too warm for the brook trout to live in. And we've also had an introduction of two other species, rainbow trout and brain, uh, brown trout, which uh, can outcompete brook trout or actually prey on them in some situations. And so we were trying to find out what kind of streams could support brook trout still. So, macrophytes. What is a macrophyte? It's pretty much just an aquatic plant, and this means that it has to be rooted in or near a body of water, and it's often more, they're often more resistant to flooding and disturbances than most terrestrial plants. Um, there are four types of flowering my, macrophytes <coughs> and three types of algae that uh, make, up, make them all up. The four types of flowering macrophytes are pretty self-explanatory. They are emergent plants, where their roots are underwater, but they have some part of the plant coming out of the stream and actually sticking out. There are rooted floating plants, which are rooted underwater, and they come up to the surface, but they don't actually stick out. They just float on the surface. There are submersed plants, which the entire plant is underwater all the time. It never breaks the surface. And then there are free-floating plants. They do not have roots, but they often get tangled up with other uh, macrophytes, so they may appear that like they do, but they really don't. The three types of algae are microscopic algae. These are singer, single cellular photosynthetic <coughs> organisms that often sit on the top of uh, the surface of the water table, or the surface of the water, and they often create a film on top, and it's really gross, it's just not cool. Um, filamentous algae is like long hair-like strands of algae and they often get tangled up in uh, substrate and other plants, and they can cause some issues also. And lastly, chara is a rooted algae that looks like uh, flowering macrophytes, but it does not produce any flowers or seeds, and it's often mistaken. <clears throat> macrophytes also act as microhabitat engineers, meaning that they have a profound effect on the physical aspects of a stream. These four graphs on the bottom came from a study uh, from 2016 that wanted to find out if a <coughs> rainbow trout preferred to live in areas with high macrophyte coverage or low macrophyte coverage. In this study, they uh, um, reviewed one particular river 
over the uh, span of summer for 2013 and 2014. They tracked macrophyte coverage, dissolved oxygen content, uh, the stream velocity, particle size, and a few other things that weren't as important. But what is important is that as summer progressed both years, macrophyte coverage in the stream increased. Because of this, there were more plants uh, going through photosynthesis in the stream, and so they could create more oxygen, which increased the dissolved oxygen content of the stream. Um, because there were more plants in the stream to actually act as an obstacle for the flow of water, they slowed, that, they slowed down the velocity and also increased the depth of the stream. And lastly, they act as a catchment for sediment in the water. So whenever sediment bumps into a plant, it's more likely to lose its energy and settle on the bottom, meaning areas that have high macrophyte coverage usually have very fine, small sediment instead of like large rocks or boulders. Um, so this is a couple pictures showing this typical stream ecology. Macrophytes, uh, they act as food habitat and provide areas to propagate for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife. Um, they are very important for aquatic bugs like shown down here because uh, bugs need these things, need uh, macrophytes to live and develop and there are certain species of aquatic bugs that they go through metamorphosis and can leave the stream and they become a major food source for the terrestrial landscape also not just the fish in stream. Um, and I would like to say that not all macrophytes, or excuse me, not all macroinvertebrates or bugs are going to be on plants. They are distributed all throughout the stream channel, like in the water, on the plants, in the dirt also. But I was trying to focus primarily on the bugs that were on the plants. Oh, another thing. Uh, there was a really cool documentary where I got this uh, figure from. It was called River Webs. And it really was trying to show like how interconnected river systems and terrestrial systems are. They are very dependent on each other. Right. So here's some cultural practices and how uh, invasive species are propagated. Many of these invasive aquatic plants are brought in as ornamentals for either gardens or aquariums. And then they're either left out to the natural elements or they're disposed of improperly and natural systems take over and can spread them through environments very rapidly. Um, some of the natural systems that work are if they get in streams, they can flow downstream, settle, and re-establish uh, themselves. They can be blown in the wind. They can often get attached to wildlife and transported elsewhere. And even on occasions, uh, some animals will eat them, and then when it passes through the digestive tract and drops out elsewhere, they can become established there. Um, one thing that I found out that was really cool is plants like these that have segmented stems, like it's not one solid piece, their uh, leaves are separated by these little individual segments. If they are broken off from their main plant and can settle um, horizontally on their side, roots can sprout out of each of these uh, individual segments, meaning that like one small uh, piece of a plant can break off and go establish a much larger colony elsewhere. Another thing, humans can uh, spread these plants unknowingly. This picture shows, it's pretty drastic, but this picture shows a boat's propeller getting caught up in a bunch of vegetation. And if that isn't cleaned off before they go elsewhere, they might be tracking these uh, plants into other water bottles, water bodies. Um, last thing, my opinion of invasive species is pretty negative but some people really like them. This is hydrilla. It, uh, it's a, considered a noxious weed in Virginia, and it's an invasive uh, submerged macrophyte, but uh, bass fishermen really love it because it provides ample area for young bass to grow up and provide good fishing. So not everyone wants to get rid of invasive species. So for my research project, I had three research sites, one on the Jackson River in Highland County, one on the North River in Bridgewater, and one on the South River in Augusta County. Uh, I selected these sites based upon three criteria. They had to be a part of the historic range of brook trout. Um, when we visited the streams, we had to make sure that there were actually macrophytes in the stream that we could work with. And we also picked sites that were relatively close to Harrisonburg so we wouldn't have to travel too far. So I took plant samples for this thing and I did this by going out to my streams, 
I would have an entry point where I'd get into the river. I would walk uh, cross-sectionally across the river, making note of any plants that I saw and collecting any unique ones. And then I'd go either upstream or downstream based upon my site, about 10 to 20 feet, turn around, do the same thing until I had gone through the entire section collect and collected uh, all the plants. This is a native species, it's Elodea, and it's one that I focus on later on for my macroinvertebrate samples. And this is an uh, invasive curly leaf pondweed. Um, also, it was really useful having a uh, plant identification source that I could use in the field. And this is one that I heard about. It's uh, NC State University Aquatic Plants. And it was really helpful for me to be able to like look at this and then look at the plants that, I, that was out there. And I could uh, identify them as the same ones I've already collected or different ones. So these are uh, the plants that I collected. I'd like you to note that the only species that were in all three streams were both native. And I'm focusing on Elodea because it was more widely distributed amongst the streams. And the invasive species that I was really focusing on was curly leaf pondweed because it was at two of the sites. And actually at the South River, it created a mat over approximately 80% of the stream bottom. And I just thought that was really interesting. <clears throat> I also took macroinvertebrate samplings or samples I did this by going out to my streams, finding um, the species of plant I would want to take a sample from, and then I would place it within the uh, sample area of the server sampler right here. I would make sure it's settled in the stream, everything, and it's not moving, and then I would go in and actually shake up the plants with my hands, and whatever would get knocked loose would immediately flow downstream and go into my net. After I had done that, I actually uh, extracted the plants with my hands also and collected those because I wanted to take a volume of the plant material, which I'll discuss more later. Once I had my net full of macroinvertebrates and my plant sample, I would go up to a workstation on the uh, shore or on the ground, and I had to get all of the sample material from my net out into a wash basin. I had to remove as much water as I could, and then I had to consolidate it and put it into a 125 milliliter sample bottle. After I did that, I would uh, take out my plant material, wash it off, make sure I had all the bugs off of that also, and uh, consolidate that material, put it in the sample bottle also, and then I would dry off my plant material as, to the best that I could. I would then put the plant material into one of these graduated cylinders. I'd measure out a known volume of water, and then I would add it to the plant material Whatever uh, the difference was between my original volume of water, uh, it, whatever was displaced would be the volume of my plant material. After I collected the samples, I needed to bring them back to the envir uh, ISAT environment lab so I could actually pick through them and identify the different species. This shows my setup under in the fume hood, just so I wouldn't uh, be uh, <coughs> around any noxious gases or anything like that while I was doing this, or not have to smell it because it stunk too. Um, and this showed, or once I had my sample, I would pour it out into a coffee filter and let all the liquid drain out, and it would leave me just a dense mass of material that I had to pick through and find all the bugs. If I couldn't identify a certain piece of material or I couldn't tell what a certain bug was, the ISAT lab also provided me a dissection, dissection scope so I could look at them closer, see their specific features, and actually identify them. So these are the counts from my macroinvertebrate samples. Uh, I would like to note that every sample was different, and that's why I took the volume, so I could normalize my data and show a relationship between each sample. I'd also like to say that these three species, stoneflies, mayflies, and mat Caddis, mayflies and caddisflies were considered sensitive species, meaning if uh, there's a, and there was alterations to the stream, uh, chemically or physically, like its temperature, these are the species that are going to respond to it first and probably die off. And also, all three of these can uh, become emergent and support um, terrestrial wildlife also. So it's really important to have those in stream. So. Here I made a physical um, 
or a visual so I could portray my data a little better. Right here, this shows that, or excuse me, I only took macroinvertebrate samples from LOD and curly leaf pondweed, one native plant and one invasive plant. Um, this table shows that for the majority of the samples, the invasive curly leaf pondweed had more or a greater richness, or I found more species, more unique species on these plants. Um, that's really what I didn't want, that's not what I wanted to find, but that's how it worked out. So this is a table of macroinvertebrate density. This is why I took the volume of the plants, so I could have the total count of each sample and divide it by the milliliters of plant data to have like a density and to compare between them. Again, for pretty much all samples, the invasive curly leaf pondweed showed higher numbers, which isn't good. But there is one positive aspect to this. The number in parentheses shows the percent of sensitive species out of the total, uh, out of the total count. So this shows that the native Elodea supported the highest ratio of sensitive species, which I think is actually pretty good for the environment because that means they'll have, uh, that means they have good water quality in the first place, and then it also means they're gonna have more macroinvertebrates to support the surrounding area afterwards, or after they become emergent. <coughs> this last table shows the Simpsons diversity <coughs> index, or the disbursement of, uh, or distribution of different uh, bug species on the plant. The lower the number, the uh, greater the diversity, or the better the distribution. Um, of the samples, curly leaf pondweed from South River had the uh, best diversity or the lowest numbers. But when we just look between the North River, the native plant Elodea had the better diversity numbers. Um, oh, and lastly, I wanted to take samples from Elodea from the South River also, but like I said earlier, the curly leaf pondweed was so dense and everywhere here, I couldn't find a patch of Elodea that like wasn't covered or tangled up with uh, curly leaf pondweed, so it just wouldn't make sense because I'd be getting samples from multiple uh, plants. <clears throat> uh, and then lastly, I took water measurements at each river to make sure that the parameters, uh, or to see if the parameters were good enough for brook trout habitat. I would, uh, the red dot is my entry point at each site where I'll get into the river, and then I would take measurements at each number to get, uh, so I can make an average and get a better idea of what the actual stream was like. <clears throat> These, so this table shows my average values for temperature, dissolved oxygen, and pH at my research sites. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that it doesn't really make sense to average pH because it's on a logarithmic scale, but the range between all four sites on the majority of my samples was only like 0.1 or 0.2. So just for showing data purposes, that's why I did it. Another thing I'd like you to look at is that as uh, the season moved from fall to winter, temperatures decreased at both uh, the North River and the South River. And because of that, dissolved oxygen increased because colder water can or contain more dissolved oxygen than warmer water. So this is to be expected. Um, I only have one set of measurements from the Jackson River because <laughs> we went there once to, you know, make sure the landowner was okay with us being on his property, which he was, but upon the second time going there, there were some other groups who had been on his property and he was just kind of getting fed up with having strangers around, so we decided it wasn't worth our time to go there anymore and bother him, really. And so what did I find about the water temperature? Um, the tolerable temperature range for brook trout is 0 to 24 degrees Celsius, and all streams met that parameter. But the ideal temperature for them to uh, uh, reproduce best and be most productive is 11 to 16, which uh, a little bit lower percents reach that. The proper DO levels for brook trout is the concentration has to be seven milligrams per liter if the water temperature is under 15 degrees Celsius and greater than nine milligrams per liter if the temperature is above 15 degrees Celsius. Both the South River and Jackson River met this just fine. 
but there was one date on the North River where the temperature was above 15 degrees Celsius and dissolved oxygen was below nine milligrams. So it's a little lacking in the dissolved oxygen content. Um, they have, brook trout have a pretty wide range, a tolerable range for pHs, which, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the streams met, the South River didn't meet it on one occasion, but <clears throat> their ideal range is much smaller and the South River also only met that on one occasion, which is kind of contradicting what's up here because they were the only one who, the only uh, stream that didn't meet uh, the tolerable range each time, but at the same time, it was the only stream that was within the ideal range on one of the sampling dates. Uh, so, here are some cultural practices for limiting the spread of invasive macrophytes. I just think we need more education on it. People need to know that, like, not all of the vegetation around them has like always been there. It's, uh, you know, some things have come in and they're not really helping our landscapes much. And this sign is a really good thing to have around any kind of dock or pond or anything where you can put a boat in. It just saying, it's saying make sure you rinse off your boat and everything beforehand because you don't want to spread these th uh, plants unintentionally. Also, if you use them as a part of a garden or aquarium, dispose of them properly. Like you don't want to just throw them outside where that gives them the chance to uh, propagate and go elsewhere. And lastly, I would say go ahead and do your research if you want to have a garden or aquarium and try to incorporate native species without having to even, you know, deal with invasive species or foreign ornamentals in the first place. Uh, and here are a few conclusions. All three streams were suitable for brook trout, but. Uh, they really didn't show ideal conditions for them right now. Macroinvertebrate habitat preference is based more upon seasonality and the current flow of the stream as opposed to like if a plant is native or invasive. Um, saying that, or even though I was saying that, native LOD did appear to support a higher ratio of sensitive macroinvertebrate species than the invasive plant curly leaf pondweed, which that's really good for the environment. So that, that's one benefit, I think, of having native plants around instead of invasive plants. And lastly, it's just, I learned that macrophytes have a profound impact on the physical characteristics of the stream. Without, uh, without these plants, there's not habitat for wildlife, so there's many fewer organisms. There's usually more erosion and things like that, and streams are just better off if they have macrophytes around. Any questions? Yep. Is there any like realistic removal strategy for the yeah. species? Uh, you can go in and do it manually, and there's also some chemical measures, but I'm never one to support dumping chemicals into a water body. There are several uh, biological uh, answers to this also, like you can add grass carp in, but there's no guarantee that they're going to eat the species that you like want them to get rid of. Yep. Um, what's the primary benefit of the sensitive species in the LOD? The primary benefit? Like versus, uh, like what, what makes the LOD so important? Like that's the one thing I'm confused about. So that's a native species. It's yeah. been around like these streams and everything forever. So like it's already been incorporated into the ecology. When we add in, or I guess not when we add in, but when other plants come in and become invasive, they tend to throw things off and like, you know, other organisms could suffer because of that. Yep. Uh, what do you think was your biggest challenge during, um, during this, whether it was trying to find a certain species or? Um, that wasn't too difficult. The hardest part of doing this was probably actually taking and going through the macroinvertebrate samples just because like <laughs> there wasn't a set up method for doing this. So I kind of had to come up with my own method and it was, it was kind of difficult like trying to get everything out of a net, remove all the water and trying to put it into a tiny bottle without like spilling anything. Right. So I had a little difficulty doing that.